risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Beloved in the Lord, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, it is so interesting to me how the one-year historic lectionary is laid out. After Holy Week concludes with Easter, there is Quasimoto Genity, there is Misericordias Domini, there's Jubilate, there's Cantate, and then Rogate, concluding with Christ's ascension to be observed next Lord's Day. The reading on the last three Sundays, Jubilate, Cantate, and Rogate, they return us back to the eve of the crucifixion. It's in the upper room discourse found in John 16. It's where Jesus comforts his disciples with the knowledge of the gifts that he is to leave after his resurrection and then, of course, after his ascension. And so what are those gifts? Well, they are the joy of the resurrection. They include the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then there is another gift that we heard in our reading today. And this is the gift of God's open ear towards His children. Now think of that. It is not an open ear towards the Turks, who even though they pray five times a day, the Lord does not promise to hear them. They don't get this gift. Nor Tibetan monks who spin their prayer wheels or they let their prayer cloths blow in the wind. They don't get the gift either. God's open ear is only directed towards you, His children. Those of you who wear the mark of the cross upon your head and upon your heart, those of you who have been baptized in the holy waters of regeneration, those of you who are forgiven their sins because of the merits and the work of Christ Jesus, this is your gift. Given not only with the command to request things of God, but the amazing promise that what you ask will be heard your Father, beloved, has given you the gift of prayer. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give you. Now Jesus has already taught His disciples what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's what Martin Luther just put together as a hymn that we just got through singing. It worked all the way through the Lord's Prayer. And of course, that prayer is the gold standard. And Jesus has already taught them by various examples and parables how important prayer is. Not to mention His own example of, as you know, seeking private places so that He could be alone to go and pray. And then here in John 16, He speaks of prayer again. Now look, I've been in church my whole life. My whole life. And whenever the pastor starts talking to the congregation about prayer, everybody who has a pulse starts getting convicted. Convicted for their lack of it. And we all know that we do not pray as we should. Our sinful, lazy flesh does not want to pray. Moreover, the devil drives us away from it and the world? Oh, the world gives us so many other better things to do with our time, like scrolling through Facebook. Folks, this is our sin. We love the things that God hates and we hate the things that God loves. So we repent. We repent of misusing and neglecting this gift of prayer. You know, in the past, I have likened my prayers to my golf game. I play golf so infrequently that there is too much for me to think about to actually enjoy it. I mean, let's see, is my, is my arm straight? Is my eye on the ball? Is my 
knee, are my knees bent? Is my rump out? Is my head down? Up slow. Down with force. And I still shank it. I hook it or I slice it. I do that so much that I'm usually done playing golf by about the fifth hole. I'm like, hey, just you keep playing, I'll just drive the cart. I am happy driving the cart and driving the cart and nothing more. And so with prayer, I used to consider way too many things as well. Wake up early, have devotions, remember all those who requested my prayers. Did I say the right thing just now? Do I need to write it down for the Lord really to hear it? Where's coffee? I need coffee. The Holy Spirit doesn't work without coffee. Can I drink coffee when I pray? Where's my answer, God? Where's my answer? And pfft. After a while, I used to give up. Because many times prayer can seem like a duty, like it's a, like it's a chore to do. But we have to keep in mind that prayer is a wonderful, wonderful privilege. It is Almighty God giving you an audience to you, promising to hear you. Do you remember Esther in your Old Testament? She was the wife of the king of Persia. She is afraid to go and speak to the king without an invitation. Esther's message to Mordecai was this. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out his golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, Esther says, I have not been called to come in to the king. To stand in front of a ruler and make a petition is a very unique privilege. And regarding prayer, it's the exact same thing. There's nothing that would require God to hear us. There is nothing to require God to listen to our prayer. Nothing that would require God to even care. Certainly we don't have any wisdom that God lacks or any grand insight that He needs. This is how I would do it, Lord, if I were in charge. But I'm not, So, but I'm letting you know. There is nothing about us and our sin, nothing about us and our unholiness that would commend our speaking into His ears. But it's against this, against our own unworthiness, that Jesus invites us to pray. It's as if He holds out the golden scepter, just like the king did with Esther, permitting us to ask Him for things, for things that we need. Jesus says it, truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Jesus is concerned about our joy. I have to ask you, is your joy full? Are you completely joyful? If the answer is no, and I suspect that it is, then pray. And stop saying prayer as a last resort. I think we've all had the experience that when we pray, it seems that our prayers are not answered, much less even heard. But they are heard. Jesus just promised us that they are. And Jesus is not a liar. God always hears our prayers, the prayers of His children, granting, now this is what I want you to take home with you today, granting either what we ask or something better. He grants either what we ask or something better. Let me explain. 
Our Old Testament reading for this morning is Numbers 21. It's a text that most of you are familiar with. The Israelites, they pass through the Red Sea and they're out wandering in the wilderness and where, it's where they grow impatient. They're grousing about the food and about not being back in Egypt. You know, when they were slaves, they're murmuring and complaining. They start speaking against God and Moses saying, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Folks, do we not identify <laughs> with the Israelites in that moment? Every one of us. God puts us through some suffering, some clamp that He squeezes in on us, and we begin to say what? Why? They say there's no food here, there's no water, and we loathe this worthless bread referring to the manna <laughs> that fell from heaven every day. No grocery shopping? There is no doubt that by the end of the first week there was already a cookbook established with what you could do with manna. There's manna lasagna, manna soup, manna goulash, manna... Vi no doubt in my mind. We hate this worthless bread. So what does God do? He permits fiery serpents to slither amongst them that start biting. And the text even tells us that some people start to die. The people then come to Moses saying, we have sinned. We've spoken against the Lord and against you, Moses. And here's the point. Pray to the Lord that He take away the serpents from us. So Moses prays. So is everybody following here? The Israelites complain. The punishment is fiery serpents, which leads them to repentance, and they repent. Now the punishment needs to go away. What is their solution? Go ask Moses. Ask Moses, please, ask God to take away the serpents. Moses prays, but God does not permit the serpents to go away. Did God hear their request? Of course He did. Did God do what they wanted Him to do? He did not. The serpents continue to slither amongst the people. God does not do what they ask, beloved. He does something better. He takes away the threat of the serpents. He takes away the fear of death. They go from deadly snake bites to nothing more than mosquito bites. For God tells Moses to make an image of one of the serpents and place it upon a pole. And if anyone is bitten and looks at the image, and believes, they live. Well, how is this better? Because as Jesus told us Himself, it is a picture of Christ upon the cross so that all would look to Him and believe. All who've been bitten by the snake of the devil would look to the Lord and believe and be saved. Saved from the serpent's bite and saved from eternal death. So again, love it. God answers their prayer, just not in the way that they expected. And He does the same for you, and He does the same for me. Beloved, He will give you what you ask for, or He will give you something better. This is why us Lutherans... This is why we have got a lock on this. When we go, when we pray, you've heard me say it before, pray for Paul Paul or Mamaw and pray that God would heal her and then she dies and we think, God didn't answer my prayer. Oh, yes, He did. Oh, yes, He did. He didn't give you what you want. But He gave you something better because now Papaw, Mamaw, is with the Lord, and she or he is more alive than they have ever been in life. He gives you what you want, or what you ask for. Something better. But Pastor, I've asked for things and not gotten them at all. And my friend, that was something 
better. Something better than you thought because the Lord knows things that you do not. You know, another frustration in prayer is that it might take a little while for the Lord to keep His promise. Ah! Ever experienced that? You know, it seems that the Lord is never in the same hurry that we're in. Have you noticed this? Jesus never runs. Never. And oh, how we grumble and complain when God doesn't just jump to it when we tell Him to. We might not see the answer to all of our prayers even while we live, but we still pray. Are you still praying for that son or daughter who've walked away from their waters of the baptism? You might come to your death before the Lord answers them. But we keep praying. And if He tarries, we let faith cling fast. The Lord's ways are not our ways, and we know this. And we trust the promise that our Lord hears our prayer, and He will answer them in His time and in His will. You know, there's a reason why every phrase and every response in our liturgy is so important. First of all, it's drawn from the Word of God. Everything, every word, drawn from the Word of God. Second, it's used in order to teach us how to pray, how to ask, and what to ask God for. The Psalms are prayers. Prayers taught by God and inspired in His Word. We rarely start any divine service without a psalm showing us how to speak His Word back to Him. Also, the collect. The collect is a prayer prayed before the Word of God is read and it changes from Sunday to Sunday focusing on the content of the Gospel or on the Epistle reading. And if you'll pay attention, you'll hear the collect always following a certain pattern. Now, we say it together collectively as a congregation, which I find quite beautiful. But if it were ever chanted, you can really hear the different pitches and the different places in which the collect focuses on something different. I mean, you can even look at it in your worship folder. First, the co first in the collect, God is addressed, and many times it's Almighty God, Merciful Father. Today's collect was simply what? Oh God. Oh God. Then there's a truth made about God that forms the basis of our request that we haven't made yet, but that we're getting ready to make. Today's was the giver of all that is good, and that's based on the epistle reading. Now comes the request. And it's tied right back to the truth just made about God. Again, today's was, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Now, when the colic is chanted, the pastor, or the cantor, generally the pastor, is going to go down. He's going to go down in tone there, because that way it always helps you to know when the request is being made. So again, if you go back and look at the, the, the formula, so to speak, it's an address, it's a truth about God, the request then is connected to the truth about God, and then it ends with a doxology. I'm trying to show you how the collect is teaching you to pray. Even in the service. It's teaching us all how to formulate our prayers. Now, is a significant prayer, Lord have mercy? You get in a situation where you just say, Lord have mercy. Yes, of course. But if we want to learn how the liturgy is teaching us, this is why it's put in there like that. We end with the doxology, serving to clarify once again that we are praying to the one and only triune God, ask anything in my name, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit even with all those tools and various models, with all of the written prayers that we have access to, which at times give voice to our prayers that we would like to pray but cannot. This is one of the things that, even as a pastor in an evangelical church, I started to fall in love with written prayers. In the evangelical world, you don't pray written prayers because somehow or another they're not tied to the Holy Spirit. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But this is true. Prayers have got to come from excordia, from the heart. And I fell in love with written prayers long before I became Lutheran. You know why? Because so many times, even as a pastor, 
I would sit and I would pray and I couldn't even verbalize words. I would just say, oh God. Oh God. I would think about my children and I would say, oh God. I would think about my parents and I would say, oh God. I would think about my friends and I would say, oh God. I would think about my brother-in-law and say, oh God. I couldn't verbalize it. Then I discovered written prayers, and it's like, oh, this is giving wind to my sails. This is exactly what I want to pray. But I didn't have the words to pray it. Praise God. And then I became Lutheran, and it's like, oh, you people have no problem with written prayers whatsoever. I'm like, howdy doody. Great. Great. Because many times we come to prayer, we have to pray. That's why we lean on written prayers. Somebody who's formulated these prayers before and we pray the exact same thing. We sinful beings, we don't know how to pray as we should. And this is what St. Paul tells the Romans. He says it very clearly. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Here's the good news. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. The Holy Spirit that Christ has given you in your baptism and in His Word intercedes for you and He prays for you. And Jesus at the right hand of the Father intercedes for you as well. So, beloved, the gifts that Christ has left behind for His church, they are to be utilized. Not to be put on a shelf and admired not to be put on a shelf to collect dust. Gifts are to be used. So the admonition is for you and for me to use them. Use this gift of prayer knowing that your Father will hear, knowing that your Father will help because He is concerned about your joy, because He loves you, and because He's called you into fellowship with His beloved Son, Jesus. And it is in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand together.